Good morning, everyone. It's great to have you here and also joining us online. As we start the session today, I'd like to do an acknowledgement of country. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the Woiwurrung and Vunurrung peoples of the Eastern Kulin Nation, whose unceded lands we are meeting today. I'd like to pay my respects to ancestors past, present, and also acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded, always was, always will be Aboriginal land. My name is Dr Maddie Ewards. I'm a Senior Project Coordinator here at RMIT, <clears throat> where I project manage the Athena Swan Initiative, which is in um, across RMIT for inclusion and diversity um, at academic, professional and vocational education levels. It's my pleasure also to introduce you today to our panel, <clears throat> Monday morning. <clears throat> and um, first off, we have Dr Leonora Rees, who's a Senior Lecturer in Economics here at RMIT. And Leonora is an economist who specialises in gender equality. She is a research fellow with the Women's Leadership Institute of Australia and recently spent time in residence at Harvard University as a research fellow with the Women and Public Policy Program. Leonora is a co-founder of the Women in Economics Network in Australia and currently serves as the WEN National Chair. And Leonora earned her PhD in economics from the University of Queensland, warmer than Melbourne, and previously served as a senior research economist for the Australian Government, Government Productivity Commission. She is currently appointed as a senior lecturer in economics at RMIT, and her research focuses on understanding gender gaps in the workforce, and she engages regularly with government, industry and community groups on gender equality issues. This includes identifying evidence-based strategies to close gender gaps and applying a gender lens to economic analysis and policy design. She was named among Apolitical's 100 Most Influential People in Gender Policy last year in 2021. So welcome, Leonora. And we also have Professor Madhu Baskaran. So Madhu is a multi-award winning electronics engineer and innovator. She has won medals from leading Australian academies and she co-leads the Functional Materials and Microsystems Research Group at RMIT University, which she established in 2010. She is an immigrant um, Australian, Australian and a passionate advocate for diversity at RMIT. She co-established the Women's Researchers Network in 2013. And she is currently on the advisory board for STEM Sisters, and she's also co-chair of Women in STEM M Australia. Welcome, Madhu. So about the session format today, um, well, we're really focusing today, we want to focus on solutions. We know that we have um, some gaps in where we're at, and we've got a lot of um, potential about where we can go across disciplines. And today is looking across both economics and across all the STEM M disciplines um, to get a sense of what's happening in those areas, where are the similarities, where are the differences, and what can we, everyone here, do about it? Um, so we'll first pass to Leonora um, to set the scene for us. Thank you. Thanks very much, Maddie. It's wonderful to be part of this session alongside Madhu uh, and for us to realise the common threads, the similarities in economics and STEM. And we hope that everyone tuning in um, will will gain some information and inspiration um, from this conversation. In, look, in terms of setting the scene, uh, we're going to use economics and STEM as sort of some case studies of uh, fields that are obviously traditionally male concentrated. And even though we see more women um, joining those um, fields more recently, those legacy effects from the past still ripple through. So we know that when we think about an economist or we think about a scientist, those gender stereotypes are at play. They shape our perceptions in unconscious ways. And the literature and the research on unconscious bias really um, uh, demonstrates that. Uh, but what we also have to consider is how do we mindfully and intentionally shift those stereotypes, those norms through active interventions. And the research is, is clear that it's not about 
changing women. It's not about fixing women. It's not that women are deficient in some way or lack the aspiration or the capability uh, to, to go into these fields. The system, the environment, the culture that we're in can play a part in determining those career choices, those study outcomes, or who's favoured for a leadership role, or who's given greater voice or influence. Um, and so the research is quite clear that it's about those systems-wide interventions, which is good because it means, you know, women don't need to carry the burden here, but it means that organisations and, and leaders and anyone who has a responsibility in uh, shaping programs and policies, they can play a role in, in this. Um, in terms of setting the scene, we uh, put together some statistics because STEM and economics, we do love statistics and data <laughs> to, to, to paint, a, paint a picture. And what you can see there on the screen are student enrolments. Um, on the left side, that's economics, and on the right side is STEM. And for those tuning in, STEM, a reminder that science, technology, engineering, medicine, and maths. And remarkably, these percentages in terms of female representation are very similar across STEM and economics. Um, on the next slide, we're talking about you know, around about one third of uh, female representation. Uh, on the next slide, we've carried out these, um, like an audit of gender representation in university academic departments. So you can see from left to right um, is the more junior positions, moving across to the right is the more senior positions. Uh, and you can see how women's representation is generally um, over-concentrated at the lower lower levels and mid-careers and then um, at, in, a, in a minority at professor uh, level. And so this is important because it tells us we've got these, these pipeline effects of, of women dropping out of the system, their careers not accelerating as quickly as men. And those leadership positions matter because that is influencing uh, the culture and making decisions about, you know, which research projects get elevated, who was um, who seen, uh, who is visible in positions of influence. So we need to work on both encouraging women into these fields and also um, progressing that pipeline. I'd also like to acknowledge this data is collected using a binary definition of gender, and this is not to the exclusion of individuals who identify beyond the binary. This is part of the way that data is collected, and there's scope to improve and broaden that data collection process as well. This is also representing women as an um, average, and of course, there are many intersectional dimensions of women's experience that mean that culture and race and socioeconomic background also intersect with gender. So that there are many other dimensions and, and layers to dive into this data as well. Um, and also I'll hand over to, to Madhu shortly to uh, break down the the observations or the, the different dynamics that happen within STEM, because you know, STEM is very multidimensional, but even within economics, we have subfields in economics, which are proportionally more um, dominated by men uh, than, than women. Within economics, fields like macroeconomics, monetary economics, trade, they're kind of seen as sort of heavy, the heavy hitting um, uh, fields um, as opposed to labour economics, health economics, which is generally more about people. Um, and it shouldn't be that way, but that tends to be where the women are generally more concentrated. So even within economics, you've got these gender patterns. Now, we've put these statistics up there. Um, it's really important to note that this is not just about a head count. So representation is important, but it's also about inclusion, belonging, um, a real sense of respect, having your opinion and your perspectives heard. So the headcount is just the starting point um, and understanding and, and um, surveying people about their experience, do they feel a sense of respect and belonging in the field um, is really the most important thing here. Not uh, So we start with the numbers, but we also want to um, respect the, the lived experience and the, and, and the reality of people's experience in the field. Madhu, I know we'll be able to say a little bit more about STEM as well. Thank you, Leonora. I mean, you, you did such a fantastic job presenting that data and also covering off those different aspects of it. So thank you for that. Um, it's it's mind boggling, actually, looking at those numbers over there and the numbers are down, like almost down to the percentage. They're pretty identical. 
but i think the point you made towards the end in terms of you know stem itself is again a mix of you know science technology engineering and mathematics and sometimes there's an extra m at the end which includes medicine as well um those numbers look actually reasonably healthier than what the truth is for say something like engineering for instance uh where the numbers are dismally low and even within science again even if you take just science out of the context you have physics you have chemistry chemistry has much more healthier numbers than physics so there's obviously similar to the economics uh, examples you gave there's a lot of disciplinary differences between these and it's again kind of similar to what you said in terms of you know where engineering again if you break down engineering you find that a lot more girls doing chemical engineering or biomedical engineering as opposed to say doing more of mechanical engineering or uh, electrical engineering and again it's it's a bit they call it a little more of a humanitarian aspect of it so it's called humanitarian engineering where girls can clearly see what they do is going to lead to an positive impact on society you know decades down the line they just naturally drawn towards those kind of fields is what they say and so it's 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 no brainer once you break it down that way to just understand which fields are going to attract more number of girls um but having said that what essentially happens is they all get banded up together as just engineering unfortunately so for instance whenever i go to schools and i see these posters which kind of breaks it down to you know st e and m the e is also always represented by a man wearing a hard hat and they say that's e it's an engineer it's it's therefore a man wearing a hard hat and rubber boots in a construction site and so when i go to school sometimes and say i'm an engineer they're like you don't look like that and i'm like no but i'm not that kind of an engineer i'm an electronics engineer and sometimes it's just 5 minutes of your time and it just opens up their eyes to you know new branches or new fields of engineering which they didn't know existed it's sad sometimes it's it is a bit sad when you think that's all it takes for you know girls to just wake up and go oh hang on there's much more engineering than just construction sites um it's changing some things are changing one of the things which i liked was when i was uh, when i had my son back in 2013 and i was trying to you know show him let books on you know what people look like the unfortunate thing and i guess again there's a parallel there with economics is kids inherently know what a nurse looks like or what a doctor looks like or what a teacher looks like they don't interact with an engineer and they probably don't interact with an economist either so you know they just don't have that picture in their head as to what an engineer might look like and so it's even more important i think to start at a very young age to start having those positive role models and rather than having something stereotyped put into their heads at that young age Uh, thank you both for setting that scene. Um, we'll next move on to some questions. And of course, for those both here and online, we really do welcome your questions following um, our discussion. Um, so do you have your thinking caps on and um, keep that in mind. So Madhu and Leonora, you are both in fields that uh, have traditionally been male dominated. So engineering and economics respectively. Can you explain and perhaps give some examples of how having more women in your field makes a difference? This is like my favorite topic right now because I do a lot of talks recently on women in technology and the way you design technology for diverse audiences. Um so the funny thing is you know there's a lot of talk now about your know, gender bias in technology or you know the in the products which are used with you and it's just amazing to think of you know so many products or so many technologies which have just not been developed keeping women in mind like they talk about the crash test dummies which have been done only for male and therefore you know women have a much higher rate of you know having much bigger issues if a car crash happens because all the data which is available is for the safety of men and so the airbags and all the designing of the car, of the safety systems within a car are for male data um and that's a very serious thing and then there's also the aspects of where you have military equipment or ill fitting you know personal protective gear which again are more suited to men and they're not really made for women so for instance i always used to read about the instance of women train drivers on the v line and how the amount of mechanical vibrations in the train is actually used to you know damage their bodies like the their breasts used to undergo a lot more damage and again it's more of the entire system is being designed keeping men in mind and not so much women so it's just amazing we des- we live in a world designed for men and for me i always think you make better decisions if you have 
a table which has the diversity reflected around it. So if you look around the table where you're making those decisions, and if that table is represented by just one half of the world's population, then chances are you think you're doing a pretty good job. But if you don't really have that full diversity around the table, then you're not going to have that same diversity reflected in whatever solutions or technology which you create for the future. And I think for me, that's just a simple reason why you just need to have much more representative fields and you need to have people represented in every fields where you know things are made to impact them in the future it's just as simple as that for me it's just and even simple things like i mean your phone for instance they are made to fit male hands a woman's hand can never navigate a phone the same way a male hand would the, the screen sizes are made for the average male hand um and i thought it's my fault <laughs> Because the first time my husband was like, oh, you just do this. And I'm like, why am, Why is my thumb not reaching across the four ends of the screen? And it's, no, I don't have small hands. The screen is not made to, you know, fit me. And people think you just make phones for women by making it pink. No, it's much more than a color. It's, you know, you need to make phones or you need to make technologies or you need to make products for a diverse audience. And that's much more than gender. I understand that. But I think our gender is a good start for the whole thing. Yeah, it's a fabulous book, isn't there? Invisible Women by Carolyn Crado Prezes. I can't remember her whole full name. Invisible Women. Um, and I know that extends to, to um, medical trials as well, um, which is scary in itself. Leonora, did you have some comments for this? As well? Sure. Look, I love that Madhu has provided some really concrete, physical, tangible examples and um the book Invisible Women is jam-packed of all these great examples of product design that is gender biased. There's an economist called Katrine Marcel who's also written a similar book called The Mother of Invention. It was women who decided to put wheels on the bottom of suitcases because men wanted to show that they were masculine, they could carry this weight. Women were like, that's not practical. So, um, And it made them more mobile. So there's lot, lots of examples. But the parallel is in economics as well. And in, in economics, we don't generally see it because it's not like a concrete product that we can feel and touch, but it plays out in terms of policy design. And one good example is that it really is female economists who would who are doing the research and the policy analysis of childcare policy and women's participation in the workforce and who pointed out that um, it, it was women who were disproportionately um, impacted by the effects of the lockdown because they their radar was up. They were they're tuning into it. Um, and so I don't think that's coincidental. I think that's a, a that comes through lived experience. It's not that men and women are necessarily innately different. It is through that lived experience of the world that impacts our capacity to see problems, to diagnose problems, um, and then to arrive at solutions. And in economics, uh, some surveys have been conducted. Um, comparing uh, men and women's perspectives and opinions on different economic con uh, concepts and topics. And they've found that women tend to place greater weight on issues of labour market inequality and climate change, and men tend to be more in favour of market-based solutions and austerity, um, probably because on the whole, they're, they're less likely to be dependent on you know government welfare in during their lifetime um and and so th there are, there are these patterns that play out and that will shape and um the, the policy decision making the, the importance of diversity is an underpinning factor in all of this so it's not necessarily um better or worse outcomes but broadening the topics that are uh canvassed and also bringing diversity of perspectives that generates a greater interrogation of the evidence. And in economics, as well as in, in scientific discovery and design, you are basically road testing, stress testing ideas, thinking about what are the blind spots? What, how, how can we improve this by thinking outside of the box? And the research in the literature is really showing that diversity that is that ingredient for in innovation ideas and also stress testing these ideas. And I'm, I'm really inspired by a quote here. This comes from the late Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And we know that uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg's um, really legacy has been one of not being afraid to state her opinion, particularly if it's a dissenting opinion in the US Supreme Court. And the quote is, there is nothing better than an impressive dissent 
to lead the author of the majority opinion, opinion to refine and clarify her or his initial circulation. So it's about putting forward an alternative point of view compels all of you to interrogate the evidence with even greater scrutiny, and that will arrive at a better outcome. And economic analysis and policy making is all about that. So really diversity, diversity of lived experience, diversity um, but, but by gender, by socioeconomic background, by race, is the ingredient that leads to uh, better outcomes and more and, and a more responsible environment in which um, policy decisions are made on behalf of citizens. So I think that really, you know, all, all the signs point towards the value of diversity. It doesn't mean it's easy. It means that handling dissent can be more and more time consuming. It means you have to be more patient, understanding, more empathetic of other people's um, designs. But we are a knowledge-based economy. We're increasingly looking at service delivery that are is oriented around people's experiences, you know, human services. So understanding the complexities of the human experience is critical. So we have to invest in that in that robust and um, inclusive decision making. Absolutely. So Madhu, you are now a co-chair of the Women in STEM M Australia, and you were a co-founder of the Women's Researchers Network at RMIT. Um, and Leonora, you are currently the national chair of the Women in Economics Network in Australia and were a co-founder of this network in 2017. So given your roles as chairs of these peak national bodies for women in your respective disciplines, can you tell us about the role of these professional organisations and what impact they have? Uh, there, there's a... Um, our logos on the screen <laughs> for our respective organisations. Maddie, would you like to go first? Yeah. Hey, thank you. So, um, so women, the Women in Economics Network was created in 2017 and it was a collective effort. So I'm honoured to be in the role of chair now, but it, it's, it's been a team effort um, and it came about uh, through the Economic Society of Australia recognising uh, they were concerned that membership within the economic society was dropping and, and women really weren't a, a, a key part of that um, and they wondered what could be done differently. And once you dive deeper, you realise there are certain things and traditions within the field that are marginalising, ostracising um, for women. So probably very similar to, to Madhu's experience with um, creating women in STEM. Um, but really the point of the network is to build a community. So I mentioned the sense of belonging and inclusion and connection. And so we, we use the word network as a way of symbolising people being connected to each other. And so for many females, they might still be in the minority. And in some cases, they're the only only girls studying economics at school. Or when I went through my um, economics uh degree, I never had a female lecturer, for instance. So, you know, it's about making sure that young women coming through the profession know that there are other women. And so there is that sense of, of connection and solidarity. I think the existence and the creation of these inst uh, these organisations is important for legitimising and validating the fact that gender inequality is an issue. It's not just in women's imaginations. Um, it validates that this is an issue and we are being mindful and intentional about addressing it. Um, it, it makes it concrete that these barriers do exist. And in economics, and I, I imagine it's similar within STEM, we approach the challenge of addressing these barriers using our economic tools. So making sure it was evidence-based, evaluation-based, data and statistics driven. What does the research say about how to tackle these barriers, these biases and these inequities? We address it in the same way that we address all these other economic problems. I always thought it was almost quite paradoxical or hypocritical that economists would do all this research and, um, you know, uh, 
prescribe all these recommendations about how to improve the world, what other people should be doing differently without looking internally within their own profession to first get their own house in order and identify the barriers, the shortcomings, the inequities that exist. So really we need to use those tools on ourselves, which is really what has brought me um, in, into this role. Um, and I think for for the economic society, it did improve what, in terms of the impact. It did improve membership. So uh, women's share of ESA membership basically doubled from about 21% to 42%. We've sustained that. And in our feedback uh, with members, um, they've made it clear that they now see that there's a lot more diversity of topics. We've made sure that um, meetings and, and events are held at more family-friendly times. We've made sure that females are amongst the keynotes, that females are nominated for the ESA Awards. We've invested a lot in media um, and hopefully some of you might even notice on, on news coverage, there are a few more female economist faces talking about the news events and that's been a concerted effort and partnership with, with um, journalists and ABC just to, to change that perception so that the general public um, of all ages, when they think about economics now, they don't just think of an, an, an old man reading the stock market report, but they they see and they hear economists talking about human issues and inequality and, and climate change um, with with a whole diversity of faces. So WEN has been really proactive um, in those ways. Um, and I, th I think maybe next we'll talk a bit about, you know, the ingredients that have, have led to that. But I think the key message I want to get across, it's been a really collective effort. Yeah, echo on the collective effort. It's always a collective effort, I think. Um, so for, for me, it is kind of a two-pronged journey in the sense I, I remember taking out my maternity leave from RMIT back in 2013. And at that point, I was told I was the first engineer engineering faculty from RMIT going on maternity leave in nearly 10 or 15 years. And they had no clue. They just didn't know what to do, like how to offer support. As an academic, the amount of the kind of support you need taking maternity leave is very different from the kind of support a professional staff member would need. So I remember being asked questions like, um, so who will replace you? And I'm like, no one, hopefully. Um, will you give up your desk? And I was like, no, not really, because no one going to come and sit over there. And so the, it's just the entire conversation which I had, which just made me and them realize we haven't done this before. And it's just really unique. It's clear she needs a lot more support than what we used to, you know, giving professional staff. It's a very different kind of feel because things don't like I remember going away on leave and coming back after six months and everything was just exactly the way it was. Right. I mean, my grants stayed where they were. All the work which was piled up was stayed exactly where it was. No one comes and just takes over and does the thing for me. Um, so I remember talking to a few other women at that point and realizing that, hey, we don't have a support network. Just come and talk to each other about how do you then navigate the space of coming back and then having the work-life balance and dealing with things, you know, as they come about. And so that's where the Women Researchers Network started. And I think the fabulous thing about RMIT was we could just go all the way to the DVCR at that point. And she said, you know, it sounds really good. Go ahead and set it up. And we just set it up at that stage in 2013, just brought women together. Initially, it was a very STEM-based one, but then we realized it needed to be much more than STEM. And then it was expanded eventually. Now it just covers the entire university. And like you're saying, the, the issues and, uh, and problems are sometimes identical across multiple disciplines. So there's no reason why the network has to stick to STEM. So it's been phenomenal to be here and see that network grow, you know, from where it was to what it is today. Um, coincidentally, at the same time, Women in STEM Australia was co-founded by two phenomenal women, uh, Margaret evans Gelia and Michelle Gallagher. And they reached out to me in 2014 and they said, would you like to be on the board of Women in STEM Australia? And I said, what's the purpose of your organization? And they said, we, we want to be a national organization and it's STEM, but then it's also including the extra M for medicine. And it's not just academia. We would love, to, we would want this to be multi-sector. So we want this to cover education, industry, government, uh, academia, or anyone who calls herself a woman in STEM, essentially. Because you don't need to be doing STEM to be a woman in STEM. You could be enabling STEM in some ways. Um, and I think for them, that that was key. And so for us, 
it's come a long way in the sense 2014 seems so long back. Um, and in reality, it was a long time because we've come a long way in terms of conversations as well, because back then it was more of telling people why this is important. Why is it important to focus on this? What are the issues? What are the problems? We looked at the same set of uh, graphs, God knows how many times. And, you know, you, you try replotting the data and replotting the data. And after a few years, you go, the data is horrible, no matter how you plot it. The numbers are reflect, you know, the sad reality of the situation. So let's just move on past the data into fixing problems. Uh, but we were able to have an active voice into a lot of national lobbying. So whenever there were policy documents which came out, we were able to, you know, have a say in that. And because we were multi-sector, we were able to talk about, you know, the different aspects of it as well. So our board was quite multi-dimensional as well. We had a person from education, we had people from industry. And again, it was the ability for us to connect between those sectors and seek mentors or people at different career levels. Um, the I think our most successful thing has been the fact that we have this fantastic Twitter handle, which just amplifies women's voices. So just reposting, retagging, re-advertising opportunities for women. So women feel like they're not excluded. They, they feel part of the entire network. And we just have people who we never met. Like I was talking to Leonora this morning. And I was like, have I ever met you? And she was like, we probably met a long time back. But there are so many women like that I know across the country who I never have really met. But I feel like I really know them very well because we've all been connected through this organization. And I think that's just a phenomenal uh, sense of, you know, you just feel like you you belong and you feel you're there. And everyone and everyone's there for you to just push your you know agenda through. Uh, but since then, we've, come, we've had input into the women in STEM decadal plan. There have been other things which have come through now. Um, but I think we've come a long way in that way that it's gone past talking about the problems and moved on to solutions. We're now in the phase where we've just, uh, like I took over as co-chair in December last year. So we are at that point now where we're re-strategizing, trying to understand we were formed with the purpose. The purpose is probably the same, but our strategy now needs to be different because we don't need to educate people about the issues anymore. Um, but how do we make sure that we stay relevant and stay current and still stay, you know, equally important for everybody? We are voluntary. So as and as I think most women do a lot of things in their magic time. Um, and so, you know, how do you make sure that we can use our time in a, in a purposeful manner to keep affecting the change which we've had? Um, so interesting to hear about both organizations. I'm wondering about the the timeline and the context, if we, we think about um, the gender equality focus in 2020, 2021 in Australia, um, the momentum, the awareness, the action that is happening across the board, what kind of time periods are we thinking of or looking back to for, your, for both of your organisations and how do you think that has um, in, inputted to um, the kind of momentum and action that we're seeing at the moment? It's, it's, uh, I don't know, I, f I find this a very, uh, it's, it's funny thing because we've realized these are not issues which cropped up yesterday. Like if you look at gender equity issues, it's a, it's decades, right? I mean, which has led to the situation we are in right now and we can't fix this overnight. It'll be silly to think we can fix it overnight. Um, but and I think initially I well, we, I was not for quotas. For instance, a lot of people spoke about having quotas. Let's start having quotas for exactly how many percentage of women we're going to have at different edu ed leadership levels. I never really liked quotas as much. I just felt like it will just add a level of bias or artificiality around the whole thing. Or, you know, it's like box ticking is what I thought. But then I wouldn't say I've changed my mind dramatically, but now I'm probably a little more on the fence right now because I've realized they actually work. For a lot of people, It's ve they're very KPI driven. So unless you put a KPI in front of them and tell them this is what you need to achieve, and if you didn't achieve this, that means you failed, that's the only thing which drives certain people towards you know solutions. So if that's what works, then that's fine. But I think there's still a level of subtlety which needs to go around that whole piece. Um, and... The problem with trying to accelerate progress is, you know, su suddenly everyone has quotas. Like just take academia, for instance. Everyone has a set percentage of women professors in STEM they want in their particular university. And what that essentially happens is the same women play musical chairs across the whole time. Like I get headhunted every alternate week, literally. And there's only this many women in the system. We still haven't solved the pipeline issue, right? So we just we just ping ponging between the same set of, you know, few women. And that's not really forming the solution to it. 
we need to be looking much earlier. And I'm, I'm talking earlier as in a lot of programs look at year nine, year 10. In my head, that's too late. Uh, kids form opinions, you know, as young as four or five. So that's why, you know, my talk about baby books and trying to form those positive uh, stereotypes in their head. Um, like, for instance, I remember going to my son's childcare and a lot of girls were asked, what do you want to be when you grow up? And all, all the kids were asked that. And most of the boys wrote, you know, I want to be Superman or, or I want to be a doctor or I want to be a police officer. And half the girls wrote, I want to be a mom. Um, and whereas some of the girls, you know, wrote, professions as well so it's a lot of they start thinking about you know what they want to be when they grow up at that young age so you need to you know be talking to them about career options or what they could be or how they could you know straddle across multiple things at that very young age but those things are going to take time so you know there are people who, who go oh i went and presented in a school last year and look nothing has changed this year it's not going to change today like you talk to a year nine student today and positively influence them to do stem it's going to be you know, seven years before you see them completing the undergraduate degree. So it's going to take a long time, but it doesn't mean it's not changing. But I think we we will make progress. It's just that we need to make find ways to just account for it. A lot of people do it as a moral imperative. They just feel like, oh, it's nice to go present in a school. You get a feel good sensation and you come back thinking you've made a positive influence. But how do you actually keep track of that and make sure that all that positivity which you infused in that one session it's not taken away by the other societal factors around them. And people are, again, not just, you know, distracted or just being drawn away from STEM because of whatever other things happen around them. So it's going to take time, but I think you need to keep tracking at different stages before you actually truly see a difference. It's probably going to be a decade before you start seeing changes in the pipeline. Yeah, you're speaking my language, Madhu. So I have a special project focus on women in STEM student engagement. Um, Victoria, unlike Queensland and some other states, does not have a unique student identifier. So we can't even do that tracking um, across time to see where people go. Um, and similarly, yeah, international best practice talks about multi-touch point programs, isn't it? There's an idea of a colleague of mine, Nicole Fetcher, talks about fly in, fly out, outreach, <laughs> and what does that achieve when, you know, we need to make this ongoing change and ongoing um, engagement? Yeah. Um, so just going back to you, Leonora, so um, I wanted to go back to the year concept when I talk about timelines or, or mm. context. My question was around years. So the WEN was established in 2017, is that right? And um, what year was Women in STEM in Australia? 2014. 2014. Mm. Okay. So we're talking mm. the last, I was going to say decade, but it's a bit mm. more than that, isn't it? A bit less. Um, Leonora, could you tell us a bit more about how you think that fits into the timeline or, or um, influence and um, focus that we have in Australia and internationally sure. at the moment? Yeah, yeah, no, it's a really good point to reflect on this timelines because, you know, we're talking about – decades and centuries of women trying to make their way in society and, and advocate for equal rights. So we have to honour the, the centuries and centuries of efforts for women, uh, you know, just to have a voice in society. Um, and even though WEN was formally created in 2017, we are very mindful that there were attempts to form a women in economics group in some shape or form in earlier decades. So we go through the meeting minutes of the Economic Society of Australia and we find little references to suggested proposals to form a women's group. Like I think it's back in 1980s or 70s, like going back and remembering that we did have these waves of feminism, right, in, in Australia and internationally. Um, and what's interesting is that those initial attempts, we really want to honour the women who made that attempt and history has shown us that those attempts haven't come to fruition in the past. And our understanding is that they didn't have enough critical mass, they didn't have the numbers, and they were shut down by alternative narratives that closed down the argument for the need for a women's group. So there is no need, you know, women are part of the profession now, there are no barriers, it is meritocratic, they can choose their own pathways. Those arguments are very alive and well, and we'll talk a bit about those, you know, expressions of resistance. And so I think we, even though we see what has eventuated, that is not to uh, dismiss the, all the 
various attempts that have been made to form something similar and possibly in STEM or in other professions it was the same. So we have to think about what is it about now and the time and place now. I think it's in some ways maybe just accumulating sufficient critical mass. I think social media has been an in, incredible enabler of democratizing and empowering the dissemination of information and breaking down hierarchies and who's who and just affording people of all levels of a profession to have a name and a voice out there rather than counting on gatekeepers to decide who is important or not to hold a microphone. I think in previous, I wouldn't be sitting here holding a microphone. I haven't earned my way yet to a senior role, but but that flattening of hierarchy and, and, and social media, I think, has, has made a difference. There's been more and more women eventually getting into those senior roles and saying, I'm going to do something about this rather than, oh, I've climbed the ladder, I've got into a professor role, others can, you know, I had to struggle so they can do the same. I think it's women like Madhu in in STEM who have said, you know, I'm going to dedicate on a volunteer basis, go out of my way to pass the net widely and and bring other women up and, and men too anyone who's been left out, marginalised. So that takes sacrifice and effort and sufficient numbers of senior women have invested in that and they've managed to persuade the leaders of organisations to allocate resources to it too. And you have to think about what's in it for them, what's in it for organisations and leaders. And I think that that knowledge has really come to the surface now that having these really unbalanced gender uh, uh, having having an organization that is severely unbalanced in terms of gender is not a good look um, so there's probably more scrutiny there's more transparency over that information now um, that's pushing leaders to be held to account and to do something now what is their motivation is it um that they look bad <laughs> for their reputation? Um, is there a more uh, noble or intrinsic motivation? They really want to make a difference. Do they recognise the gains of diversity? So there's probably an array of different motivations, but probably those factors have strengthened and crystallised over time. And we've been joining the dots with what has been happening internationally. So we have, we're have we far more aware of these organisations growing and flourishing internationally. And now within Australia, we're saying to the Economic Society, hey, you're behind. These women's groups have been in existence for several decades in Europe, in the UK, in Canada, in America, in other parts of the world. Australia is really behind the ball now. So there's all those kinds of pressures that are probably just, you know, crystallised as sort of a magical moment. But the the challenge now is to sustain the momentum. Um, there's such thing as gender equality fatigue. We hear about it. The Workplace Gender Equality Agency talks about people sort of going through a phase where they're really enthusiastic and committed and then it's it gets exhausting. The energy levels get depleted. The resources go elsewhere. So this is about how do you build that systemic change into the system so you don't need to be so... Uh, it, in intensively thinking about it and you've set the system and the processes and policies in place so that they can keep rolling on. Um, so, yeah, the timing is a really, really important one. I think globally we had the Me Too movement. We had various little events that kind of, I guess, um, amplified or accelerated and made the issue more salient. Um which helps, um, but it does take mo momentum and um, a long-term approach here. And a great example of um, the systemic structures that have now been put in place too, of course, is the Victorian Gender Equality Commission um, and the requirements for public organisations and institutions to meet um, to meet the the uh, the framework and act. Um, and if not, then it's off to VCAT. So that's very much the stick approach. But um, thinking of that balance between carrot and stick, always important. We'll move on to the, the next focus, which um, is, is we, we, we know that the, the path towards gender equality can be rocky and that progress is not always smooth. So where has progress been made in increasing women's representation in your fields? And with respect to your organisation's initiatives, um, what were the critical ingredients that contributed to the progress?
uh, did you did you want to come in on that one? I, I could. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm going to start by giving you an example. And for instance, the Australian Research Council or the uh, National Health and Medical Research Council, the ARC and NHMRC, um, take around 10 years back, you wouldn't have had this case for, they have a section there which is called relative to opportunity. And so, you know, you have this ability now to add that layer of story of this is my life and this is how, you know, life events have impacted my track record. And so my track record is not going to look identical to somebody else who's probably exactly the same number of years out of a PhD. I think it's that's a significant change. You know, having that ability to put it in over there, because I remember the first time I went, and I think that change has been mirrored across multiple things, like even across promotion applications or across recruitment campaigns. It, it's just slowly trickling down to various things because most people, when you apply for things, be it a promotion or be it for a grant or be it for a job, you just submit your CV and your CV doesn't really tell you much of, as I found with a lot of women, we hesitate to put a lot of things on paper because we just feel like we, we it makes us look like we're giving excuses for something, but it's not true. What we're trying to do is actually we're trying to paint a picture for the person who's assessing it, telling them that this is exactly what has happened in my life. There have been all these interruptions at these different points. So you need to take into account all these different things rather than just comparing me stock standard against, say, somebody else's CV who has not had any kind of interruptions whatsoever, luckily. I think that's made a big difference. Having that ability to put that in. Um, and I think men have appreciated having that as well because everyone has career interruptions. It's not just parental or maternity leave. I think when we started talking about a lot of these things, we were only focusing on the maternity leave aspects. But when you look about the intersectionality aspects of it, everyone's impacted by it. So like when you when you migrate from one country to another, your life is disrupted in a way which you never imagined it would be. It takes you six months to one year to settle down to a new place, to settle down to a new position, to settle down to a new city and a culture. And that is something you can record within this kind of a piece. So I don't think there was backlash in bringing that aspect of it in. So that way, that was a good thing because it allowed everyone to write about, you know, how my life has been interrupted. And so you need to take into account this particular piece. And the same thing kind of lends itself to the pandemic as well, which is harder. In my in my opinion, it's much harder now to assess track records because We've all been impacted by the same pandemic, but in completely different ways. Our life in Victoria has been impacted significantly differently to, say, life in Perth, for instance, um, where, you know, you didn't have any kind of lockdowns. Life went on as, as otherwise, but you had other kind of maybe interruptions and things which, you know, you, it's difficult for you to account for. So it's very difficult now for us to write grants or write a, apply for a job and say, bear in mind, I had a pandemic. And they go, yeah, but, but we went through the same pandemic. And they're like, no, but I was in Victoria and we had like seven lockdowns. And so my lab was shut down or whatever it might be. So hopefully those are things which I'm hoping it's, it's left, led to a positive influence for everybody. Uh, when it came to having targets and things like that, a lot of the things which we do in STEM now is we actually have targeted recruitment where we just have women only recruitment rounds. Um, and again, that definitely led to some backlash initially because a lot of men who basically went, but you're taking away my job and giving it to a woman or, you know, your women are progressing at the expense of men, men not being able to progress and things like that. Um, but then you just real, and I think sometimes you, you can account for some things, you can t- try and explain it, but sometimes you just have to go, you know, that this is what it is. We need to set it right because we can't set it right. Otherwise they do it at a very young age. And I thought it's just done. At the academic level, like for instance, my uh, co-educational schools, they or they apply it as well to maintain gender balance, so they can actually accelerate a girl's position in the waiting list, just to bring it up and make sure that gender balance is reached at in co-educational schools from a very young age. I didn't know that, and, and so it's just amazing that you can take that aspect and apply it at different levels for you know a person's life. Um, I think, but. but but the results will, I guess, will speak for themselves, but it is hard. Like, I think the word you used was exhaustion, right? I mean, you're just tired, constantly having to battle all these people and battle the backlash. One thing which I've been saying quite recently, and I'm conscious because yours is called Women in Economics and mine's called Women in STEM Australia as well. We tend to band a lot. We form these networks so that women can come together and have a networking point and a touch base and a mentoring relationship but then we're trying to tackle issues which are way beyond women. For me, like 
this is future inclusive festival and i think a lot of the issues we're talking about are gender issues are people's problems so excluding the men or the other genders from it i don't think is a way forward but unfortunately when we name something women in stem australia or women in something we automatically i think exclude or people just don't feel included enough to come and sit in that conversation or be part of that solution i think we just need to find ways to bring everybody together because it's not a women's problem and certainly not women's problem to solve by themselves you just need everyone working together to solve those issues yeah so many good points there maju and mary so this question was about you know um impact but also challenges i guess intertwined and i should highlight that men are actually invited to be part of the women in economics network 15% of our members are men um and that's a, sh- a sign of them showing their support and solidarity and support for the cause so madu's exactly right that we just we don't want to be divisive in in our attempt <laughs> to actually be more inclusive and some of the feedback we've received is that really what wen has done is broaden the agenda in ways that men it has brought awareness to some of the ways that men are sort of out of the picture with respect to caring for instance um or face stereotypes and expectations of behavior that are gender patterned so it really is about opening up that that box of a broader um conversation and reality um some great examples i think it's great to provide these examples of how you know the organizations have made a difference so um with when um for the first time at an australian conference of economists we had a family room a parent room so men women anyone with caring responsibilities could bring their children um and feel included so it's reducing those those barriers to people who have caring responsibilities um in the economic society of australia there are annual awards which recognize contributions and achievements and there is the young economist of the year which um young is defined as under 40 which for the lifetime of an economist i guess <laughs> um uh, that that's how they think uh but the problem was because women are taking time out during their career disproportionately more than men to have children or look after um other family members that was basically um cutting out a slice of that window of opportunity to accumulate those accomplishments that would put forward your case for why you should be considered eligible for this award so when advocated for that award criteria to be amended to take into account time spent outside of um professional career um similar to the relative to opportunity criteria and since then we've had a, a much higher representation of women being shortlisted and being awarded merit based awards but that slight amendment um on the basis of responding to gender patterns in household and social responsibilities um has now tilted the balance to be more more inclusive and there's been some amazing women um who have received received that award um so that's an example of when advocating for that systemic change um and also i think we've designed initiatives which really have allowed younger and mid career women to prove their leadership capability often it's a case as a woman that you might want to apply for a position that you know that you're capable of someone else one of your friends has said yeah you you go for it and then the feedback comes through oh no you've just got to bide your time you don't have enough experience yet you know a few more years get a few more years under your belt well and when we're like no go for it so chair of the committee run this initiative uh run an online blog and then they're proving no we can do it we have leadership capability we have innovation we have creativity we can organize um and so it's allowing women the environment the forum to demonstrate the amazing capabilities they have when elsewhere in their formal organizations they would be denied and and shut out of that process and the la- the last example i've got here is um a great quote that we received i talked about the women being more present in the media we had this amazing quote come through from a when member who had previously not been tuning into economist on the news and um started watching the abc and enrolled in a masters in economics and said to us 
Um, I just assumed that most economists were women because I started watching the ABC and I saw so many female economists. And then I was really baffled when I found out later that technically they only make up 30%. She just assumed that most economists were women. And that was as a result of watching this news coverage. Um, They have the 50-50 project at the ABC um, to set the default. The default is men and women 50-50 representation. So the, all these little examples of actually making making a difference, but that's not to say it was with it, with its without its challenges. Like it, it de- we definitely had points of resistance and scepticism, especially early on. And um, when we encountered that, that prompted me to look into the literature and research on resistance to diversity and equality initiatives. And that helped me to make sense of, of some of these points of resistance. So um, we can talk a bit more about that as well. I was just going to add one point on that one. And it, you know, it, it's the, it's a standard thing, right? It, it takes so much longer to do what is right, but most people just choose to do what is easy. And usually what is easy is not essentially what is right. So a lot of the resistance is not just from the people who are affected by it, but it's also the people who are having to make those changes and change the way of operating when they've done a, something a certain specific way for the last 30, 40 years. Um, like, for instance, it was especially harder even during the pandemic, for instance, if you're trying to put anything new. Because people went, I'm already exhausted. I'm already doing all these things. And you're now asking me to come and change the way I'm doing things. I'm just used to doing this. This, this is how I've done it for the last 10 years. I'll just keep doing it the same way. So the resistance comes from different places. It's not just the people who will be impacted by it because of the positivity or negativity of the outcome, but it's also the people who have to, you know, do the entire processing and any kind of change and resistance to, you know, change in the way you do something. I think it just comes from different quarters. And in some ways, the pandemic didn't help because people were already exhausted having to change so many ways in which they operated that asking them to, you know, change more things was just there was more resistance in those particular areas as well. Some of them didn't, but a lot of people just felt it's just too exhausting to even come up with, you know, a new way of recruiting or a new way of assessing promotions or a new way of assessing a grant when you've just done it a certain specific way for the last 10 years. And obviously the results show very bad. This, there's a huge disparity in the results and you're trying to change things now and people don't have the energy or the passion for it anymore. So, but, you know, you you need to work your way through it. And sometimes time is your enemy because you just go but I need to get I need to have done this yesterday and I don't have the time right now to do it let's just do it quickly and be done with it so sometimes time becomes the enemy the people who are trying to implement it because it's just they're just tired of of doing something new that becomes the enemy as well so it's things like that which need to be taken into account as well it's not just people who are impacted as a result of the decision making but it's also the entire process which in, by way in which you do things which is obviously going to take a lot more time because you're changing the way you're doing things yes and it's all intersecting identities isn't it um, everyone working towards this yeah um leonora did you pop up the, yeah, the information on resistance. Yeah, so on yep. the screen there, I think just following on what Madhu has said, you know, the types of expressions of resistance, why we can't do so, we're exhausted, we don't have the resource at the moment, I'm uh, I'm fatigued, I've got other other obligations. Um, I've got some example quotes there and I, and I wonder amongst the audience here, have you heard any of these expressions as well? Yeah, um, you, you, you can put forward a great case for why we should invest in equality and diversity initiatives, and yet we will still uh, hear a range of reasons why we can't or we shouldn't. Um, so the meritocracy argument <laughs> is always there. Um, the the counter argument that affirmative action policies are discrimination against against men. Um, sometimes we want to do something, but we don't know where to start. So that feeling of being overwhelmed, what, what exactly do we do? Women themselves might be opposed. I don't want to be the special treatment. I don't want to be the token hire. We had many women who actually did not want to have anything to do with when they were afraid of how they might be perceived by others in the profession, of, you know, affiliating themselves with that type of initiative. Um something called frequency illusion bias. We have, women have the freedom to do anything and there's women everywhere now. They're on all the boards. Haven't you heard that? So there's no need for diversity policy. So that comes about when uh, people start to tune in and then there's an 
a perception that women are actually more present than they actually are. So it's called frequency illusion bias. Uh, we don't have the resources, the time, the energy at the moment. We're depleted. Well, what about this one? We want women to succeed, but not at the expense of men or a twist on that by our former prime minister. So this is about the the, the zero-sum game. So if we invest in women's uh, initiatives or diversity, it's squeezing out others. So there's this whole range of um, potential arguments that we have to encounter. Um, some key themes that come out of the literature um, can help to explain why we just don't see uh, people, you know, being com coming on board with these initiatives or um, pushing back and making things difficult. The Workplace Gender Equality Agency talks about action gaps. So you might sort of undertake the analysis, but then you're quite paralysed in matching intention with action. So there might be a whole lot of goodwill and reports done, but just doesn't trans transform into action. Um, there is a concept called competing commitments, which suggests that sometimes people are quite paralyzed in taking action because they've already committed to something else, a value or a statement, and they're worried about looking contradictory. So the meritocracy argument, certain political spheres or organizations may have held on to that argument. And then when you suggest something like quotas, they see that as um, as being hypocritical or uh um, sort of offset setting or counteracting something else that they've already claimed as part of their identity and their status. So we have to navigate that. It, if you look into it, it it's not, but that's they're worried about that perception. Um, and there's this great um, school of thought talking about adding fuel versus removing friction. So adding fuel could be where you are putting forth this great case for why we should invest in equality and diversity is going to um, improve outcomes, improve performance. So that's your your fuel, your, your case for. And we can't do that without considering all these other reasons why people won't do it. So removing the friction. So it's a bit like a doctor saying to a patient, um, you know, you've, you've got to become I'm healthier, you've got to eat, eat healthy food, exercise more, and they've got a really strong argument why they should do that. But they've all their reasons why, you know, they're uncertain, they're not sure what to do, they're, they, they might aspire to make that change, but, um, you know, they're, they're awkward about going and exercising, they don't want to go to the gym, you know, they don't know where to start with the food. So there's all these reasons for them not to do it. Um, and I think we do that a lot in gender equality. So we put forward the case, here's why you should. And we haven't stopped to pause, hang on, there's a reason why people are hanging on to existing traditions or the existing gender stereotypes give people a sense of identity and, and certainty. Um, are we considering that first before just assuming that everybody is on board? And then a really fascinating piece of research dives into some of the personality dispositions of people who are a bit uh, opposed to diversity initiatives. And what they did was they surveyed people um, to find out who was most supportive of diversity and equality, who was least supportive. Looking at the people who were least supportive, they were characterised by two key personality characteristics. Um, they placed very high weight on the value of conservatism, so tradition, maintaining the status quo. Tradition meant a lot. So you can understand how making a change is seen as a threat to the preservation and the elevation of tradition. And the second characteristic is they placed a high weight on something called self-enhancement. And that means opportunities for one's own success and status and opportunities to advance um, one's power. And so you can join the dots there and understand how people who place a high value on, on their own progress and power can perceive diversity and equality initiatives as a threat to that. And that's what we see when we look at survey responses, people being opposed, for example, the uh, uh, being opposed to affirmative action and saying, well, this is, this is unfair for men now. I haven't done anything wrong. And yet now there are special opportunities for women and I'm being left behind or squeezed out of the picture. So that is very consistent with, with what we see in the literature here.
Um, another way to also contemplate it is that when people find themselves in a situation where they're compelled to take on a shock, a change, something that's outside of their control, some of you might be familiar with this concept of a grief cycle, which is like a sequence of emotions that people tend to display when they find themselves in a confrontational situation and they're, and they're compelled to change. So it kind of begins with shock and denial. It progresses through to anger, bargaining, depression, which can be characterized by being quite paralyzed, not being not knowing what to do before you finally uh, arrive at acceptance of the need for change and finding meaning. And if we think back to some of those um, quotes that we saw earlier about the expressions of resistance, in some ways you can kind of map them out to different stages of this emotional sequence. So people who are saying, we already choose the best person for the job, we have a meritocratic system, that's almost a state of denial. Like that, They're very early on in the piece. They, they have to get through that denial before you can attempt to sort of make more progress. Um, the expressions of anger, affirmative action policies are discrimination against men. That comes from a place of perceived injustice. Justice is really important for a lot of people. So that anger can be a manifestation of that sense of justice being taken away from you. Uh, bargaining. So this sort of, can we negotiate here? We want women to succeed, but just not at the expense of men. So that's your zero-sum game. That's your bargaining. So they may have accepted, uh, we have, a, uh, you know, uh, we're past denial, we've got through anger. We want to find a way, but we just don't want it to disadvantage men. The depression state could be characterised by that one of lethargy and paralysis, not knowing what to do. So you've reached a point of, okay, we need to do something, just not sure what. And that's where information, evidence-based policy is really important. So you're equipping people with the capability to do something and then we might get to acceptance where these are all the advocates. Gender equality is good for business, you know, so they suddenly are spooking or um, on on board. And I think what you'll find is a lot of people will identify with going through that stage. And if you are in the business of inclusion and diversity initiatives, you probably do hear these, these comments. And for me, at least, it's helped me to try to map it so I can think, okay, that's where that person is at as part of their journey and we're going to give them time and resources and understanding and empathy to get through those stages. Possibly, possibly they might not, we don't have to force them <laughs> to get through, but it really helps. It helps to situate where in this ongoing exchange and interaction and not everyone is instantly on board and you have to meet people where they're at through information, through empathy, through them understanding your reasons and you understanding their reasons. And I think that opens up for a more fruitful, fruitful exchange. So that's some thoughts to hopefully um, uh, empower the audience with. So when they are in, in finding themselves in these exchanges, they can sort of help to make sense of it a little more. Well, thank you, Leonora. <clears throat> so this conference is about looking to the future and how we can build a more inclusive society. And indeed, um, we kind of briefly touched on it before, the idea of um, people going for promotion or not feeling like they fit. And I've heard that the, um, the phrase imposter syndrome or the idea of imposter syndrome um, is more of a, a symptom of a broken system and of the thought that you don't fit into this broken system. And it's not just with respect to, to gender equality, of course, but in terms of um, diversity, inclusion and belonging for all individuals across all demographics, identities and backgrounds, what advice do you have for audience members that are seeking to improve within their organisations, teams or communities? I think I'll go back to the one of the very first points which Leonora made, which was fix the system and don't focus on fixing the women. Um, there are a lot of initiatives now in place where it's about let's give additional professional development to the women. Let's, um, you know, just give them more confidence. It's nice for sure. I mean, I, I'll take those uh, having more confidence is always a bonus uh, problem or not. But I think that's not the be all and end all. A lot of organizations do that as a feel good factor and go, oh, yeah, we're addressing the entire issue. We just we've given extra professional development and you spent money on all these women. And we've done that. But the truth is, if the system is not in a place where it's inclusive of everybody, then there's no point doing this anyway. We'll probably take the professional development and move to a different place where it's probably more welcoming. Um, but 
unfortunately, there's a lot around that space now where a lot of focus is on fixing the women. It's about, you know, telling them, don't be aggressive, you know, word your emails a certain specific way, take a particular stance this way, don't do it this particular way. But I'll be brutally honest. I'll, I'll And for me, I'll have a lot of self-reflection on that aspect as well. For me, it's been quite fascinating because I'm, I co-lead a research group and I co-lead the research group with my husband. So we've kind of just come on the same path all the way. Like we've done our master's together. We did our PhDs together. We've had the academic career pathway together. And when I think about all those key instances, when I've made decisions, I've hesitated. Like I've definitely gone, gone there and gone, no, I'm not good enough for this. I'm not going to do this right now. I'm not going to apply for this right now. I've always had people like him or the others say, no, don't wait, just go for it, just go for it. And then I've gone for it and then it's had a positive outcome. But there have been instances where I've sat there and hesitated from sending an email or taking a stance or putting my point forward. And I've hesitated and then just sat down and gone, hang on, what would he do in this instance? And if I think if he is going to go ahead and do it, then I will do it too. And then I've gone ahead and done it. And then it's, it's you know, sometimes had a positive influence. But today, thinking back, I'm thinking, did I change myself by doing that? Like, did I do exactly the fixing the women aspect of it by doing that? Because I realize it's okay to do it. And in some ways, I'm realizing that's why it's a two-pronged approach. We do need to tell women, you don't need to hesitate so much. You don't need to, we are much more scared about burning bridges, for sure. Uh, because I put out a women-only recruitment round last year. And I remember 30 to 40 women across the world contacted me saying, am I good enough? Can I apply? Um, I'm not so sure. You've said start date is negotiable, but I, I never said January, but then I only finish on January 10th. Is it okay if I join on January 11th? And I'm like, that's just, just, just go ahead and apply. Like, don't, like, don't, you know, break it down that level of, we're just looking for opportunities where we can, I think we just don't like to take no as an answer. And when we want to put in an effort and do something, we want to make sure it's successful. So we, we it, the usual thing, which they say, you, you have a job ad and you have 10 selection criteria and women will want to satisfy all 10 of them the best way possible before they put their hat into the ring. Whereas man would go, oh, yeah, I'm, point one looks okay. The remaining nine, who cares about it anyway? I'll just throw my hat into the ring anyway. Unfortunately, true. I, I just used to think these are stereotypes, but running my own recruitment round last year, women only recruitment round is exactly that. And I always keep telling the story that is a women only recruitment round. I had 120 applications, 40 were men. So, you know, if men can apply to a women only recruitment round, trust me, we can do anything. <laughs> so, I, there is there's something there, right? I mean, there's definitely a, and uh, there's there's a lot of truth to a lot of those things you hear, which you surely look sometimes read about these things in a news article. Go, that looks like a myth. Come on, it can't be as bad as that. And then you run around like this and gain from experience. Oh my God, half those things which people say is absolutely true. This is how people actually truly work or you know behave in a, in a particular professional setting. So for me, I think it comes back to that same point of, you know, there is a lot of element of fixing the system and not fixing the women. But there are some elements for us where, you know, we do need to, probably we need to boost our self-confidence a little bit and get there. And, you know, they talk a lot about leaning in. Again, it's a very controversial topic. But, and I, but on the flip side of it, I think it will naturally emerge once we fix the system in such a way that the audience is more, people in the system are more diverse and inclusive. I think we will become more authentic. We will learn to, you know, be more comfortable in our own shoes once we know that we are accepted for who we are rather than having to mold ourselves into someone who will be accepted. So it's a bit of both, but there is a waiting game to be played until that point. Oh, absolutely. Echo what Madhu has said. There's an excellent book by the behavioral economist Iris Bonnet called What Works? Gender Equality by Design. And it's looking at the evidence and the research on how to correct and cleanse the, the biases from the system. Um, and it's important to understand we all carry around these biases, men, women, everyone. We all have these biases. We have biases against men who turn up at daycare centres and there's judgments and there's stigma and there's stereotypes attached to that. So collectively, we do need to 
change the system and the culture so that both men and women are liberated from these biases and so their decisions, their everyday actions are not determined by these these biases. I hate the concept of imposter syndrome. I feel like it's it's encouraging women to diagnose themselves. The calling it a syndrome is very problematic in itself, but it should it, it's a signal like what is it about the culture and the system that's making women feel inferior rather than why are we expecting women to feel that way and telling them they should feel that way? Like I, I go out of my way not to perpetuate the concept because I think it's very harmful and we should instead be thinking what are the flaws and the inequities that are leaving women feeling this way? We shouldn't be validating it or legitimising it. Uh, we should be call it, calling it out, I think. Um, and the other thing about the intersectionality approach is that to understand that some interventions might work well for supporting women who are from an Anglo-Saxon background, from a middle or upper class background, um, and they can actually do more harm to women who are from uh, from from not within that majority cultural representation. So. It's really important for the, the evidence base, the evaluation to be part of um, part of this. I think we go back to our very initial story or narrative. We talked about um, this common path towards gender equality is one of, is there a problem? And then what's the cause of the problem? And now let's focus on solutions. And we also need evaluation. We need evaluation of those, those solutions, those attempted solutions to feed back into the cycle and the path towards progress as well. Absolutely, really well said. And in some ways, binary gender has been the most easy data to first access, hasn't it? We've got a long way to go with our intersectional approach to evaluation. And, yeah. and the data collection process needs to be done in a very sensitive, careful and culturally respectful way. Psychological safe, safety, absolutely. Um, we have just under 10 minutes to go, so I'm very keen to open up to questions for both people here on and online. Um, over to over to the audience. Which I can share, but if, if anyone in the room would like to start, pop your hand up. No? I'm a mic no Yeah, that's me. <laughs> um, so this one came through from Hui Xian online, um, asking about uh, asking about what we can do to get younger students. They said junior high school, but Madhu, you even mentioned primary school. You know what what are some of the practical things that we can do to to get younger students um, interested and excited um, and and seeing themselves in those roles and those careers at a really early age. Um, yeah, and to, to make it a bit more fun, I was thinking f f from my own perspective, like are there, are there you know, books, educational resources, podcasts, games, things like that that you might recommend to, to people who want their students to be able to see themselves in STEM or in economics? I recently saw a book which was Quantum Physics for Babies, and I was like, hmm. Or maybe I need to start by reading that book first because that's way too early in my opinion. Uh, but um, the Women in STEM Ambassador, who, uh, Lisa Harvey Smith, uh, she has a world of resources which she's put out in the last couple of years. Uh, there was, in fact, there was a game a couple of years back which you know allows kids to go in and and do problem solving and try and figure out like what their career options are and things like that. Um, making it fun is definitely key. But I think to Maddie's point earlier you need multiple touch points. We can't just do one standalone event in year four or year five, walk away from it and assume that that's going to have a positive impact when they actually make career choices six or seven years later. Uh, we do a lot of things. We have kids coming into RMIT to you know do experience days and things like that. We have academics from RMIT or from other organizations going into schools to go and talk about you know what we do. But I think those are very individualistic things in some ways, because ultimately, as far as I'm concerned, kids make choices depending on their peer and they also do it depending on their friends and family. So for me, a, a touch point is always convincing the family members and convincing society in general that this is a valuable career option for all genders. So it's though we focus a lot on the kids, 
a lot of decisions for them are kind of influenced a lot by their parents by uh, the careers counselors by their friends by the friends and the other family members they talk to or by their peers so it's almost like you need an approach which goes beyond the kids to make sure that everyone understands um i remember being part of a men in stem decadal plan and we had some consultation sessions and there was a couple of them who were coming in and talking about a tool they were actually developing for parents for instance where if say your child comes home one day and says mom i want to be an aerospace engineer and mom goes you know oh, i don't know what that is what, what what kind of you know life prospects do you have by doing that they've actually going to develop a website where you literally key in whatever and then you get up things spit out for you in terms of this is what your child would be doing in the future this is the kind of what kind of money they could be earning and this is potentially what a career pathway for them can look like so parents don't just go i don't know what that is that means you can't be it you know let them go and educate themselves and come back to the child and give them that perspective of oh yeah that sounds interesting you know go for it so for me i think it's more of having that multiple touch points rather than just focusing on child at one point it's focusing on the kids at different stages in their school life but also focusing on all those other different influential factors for them Yeah in economics there's a great book for young kids called E for economics like a picture book so like M for monopoly and for Nash equilibrium so you can start really young um also when has an initiative we have a media and public speaking register and if you're a when member you can tick the box to say you are available to go and speak to school students so we we we're, we're making sure that there's the opportunity for real world economists to go in, into the classroom and speak so if there are teachers tuning in or career guidance counselors um please take a look at the when register and then that's that's real world economists who are keen to come in and speak about their careers um with your students um the reserve bank of australia conducted a great survey of school students asking them what were the um the topics of interest that motivated them to study economics and there was a real strong gender pattern for men uh, for the boys the, the male students um the topics that were most interesting to them were um share market the so stock market and for women it was solving problems and globalization so there was something in there about women these female students being motivated about trying to solve the world <laughs> fix the world uh and so tapping into that intrinsic motivation is really important there's another piece of research that shows that they try to incentivize um this is in the US they try to incentivize students to study economics by sending them a letter telling them how much they could earn in economics and any guesses what happened the female students were put off they actually had less interest and the male students were more likely to be attracted it worked for students who wanted to go into accounting but not economics and if you think about it economics has this problem of this image thinking economists just care about profit and money and and that wasn't helping that letter was not helping it was perpetuating that misinformation mis misinformed image so we have to be really careful about what we talk about and when it comes to parents your parents want job security for their student uh, for their for their children and if we talk about how much economists can earn we don't say oh this is what you can earn we say this is how important and how valuable economics is to society that you can get a secure um job and and have a really comfortable um uh financial future so it talks about that career that that um earnings is being an indication of the value of that career for society rather than try uh, perpetuating this this uh, myth that economists just care about care about money the other key thing is getting to um students in low socioeconomic areas that's the big concern economics is not offered in a lot of schools in a lot of public schools particularly in in uh regional areas and in low socioeconomic areas and that's has huge repercussions for who is going to flow through to be the economist in the central bank in treasury making these decisions that people from uh, th this part of society is not part of that picture so we we definitely need to be mindful about making economics meaningful to that uh, those students and reaching them and that sense of inclusion and belonging for them 
Absolutely. So I've worked in um, STEM equity interventions in high school for the last eight years and have really thought deeply and strategically about what works and what doesn't. And as we've all just mentioned overall, and as we've talked about in workplaces too, it's culture, isn't it? It's the idea of you feeling like you fit or you could fit in the future and what that means for you. So um, in my work, I bring together the schools the tertiary institutions and industry partners together to to show what's possible, but um, also not um, working with individual schools in the ways that work for them. So creating that cultural shift within um, low socioeconomic schools. So for the program we, we run called Future STEM Leaders, sometimes we go to the schools, sometimes the schools come here. Um, it's a deep and, and strong uh, and true partnership to create that cultural change. And we train the um, year nine and ten girls to be STEM leaders and take agency over the content to then um, lead workshops for students of all genders in the school. And over time, we hope to see those younger students coming up and being STEM leaders in the future as well. So there's a lot we can do, but I guess overall it comes down to feeling safe, having a really supportive and inclusive culture. Um, and thinking to the future too, like our conference um, is titled as well. Yeah, that brings us to the end of the session for today. Um, a big thank you both to Leonora and Madhu for your time today. Um, and I'd also very much like to um, call out and to thank Campbell as well um, for supporting us in this session and making it all happen. So thank you as well as our AV and other supports. Um, for throughout the conference. Um, and also thanks for those who've joined us both online and in person. I've heard it's the coldest day in the year. <laughs> um, but here we are together and hopefully we've taken some warmth from the discussion today and thought about future applications and our role within that. Um, so have a wonderful day um, and please reach out to any of us if you'd like to learn more about um, what we do or if we'd like to discuss further. Thank you.